Good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to this uh, 1010 webinar. My name is Giovanni, and I will be your webinar moderator today. Today's webinar will be about the participation of small and medium enterprises in standardization. Now, before starting the presentation, I would like to remind you that all attendees are muted. But of course, you still have the possibility to ask all questions using the question panel in the webinar control panel, which are in front of you. We will review and answer your questions at the end of the presentation. Should your question not be answered today, don't worry. The questions and answers raised today will be made available on the Sense Analytic website as soon as possible, together with this presentation and the recorded webinar. Sanence Analytic is also on Twitter. So if you like, please use the hashtag, hashtag 1010 webinar to tweet about the webinar. Well, now it's time to give the floor to the speakers of today. You will be guided through all this by my colleague Ingrid Sutair, Project Manager Policy and Stakeholder Engagement, and by Mr. Crystal Davidson, Director at SBS Small Business Standard. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Giovanni. Good morning. Today's presentation will indeed be on the participation and representation of SMEs in standardization. We will briefly cover the inclusiveness of the European standardization system say a few words on Regulation 1025 of 2012 and on SBS partnership with CEN and CENELEC. Then Christelle will inform you on what SBS or Small Business Standards is, what they do, and we will inform you on how SBS participates within CEN and CENELEC. Christelle will also brief you on an SME compatibility test that SBS is developing and for which SBS asks our cooperation. Let's start with the representation of SMEs in standardization. Senate Senelec's goal is to develop European standards and other technical specifications to respond to the needs of European industry, large and small, while meeting consumer, environmental, and other societal expectations. Through cooperation with all main stakeholders, SEN and Senelec are actively engaged in removing trade barriers for European industry and contribute to the consolidation of the European single market. SMEs, just like other stakeholders, are encouraged to engage with the national standardization organizations and to take part in the European and international standardization system through these national standardization organizations. Regulation 1025 of 2012 on European standardization also stresses the importance of SMEs' participation at national level and this complemented through the support at the European level from a European stakeholder organization receiving union financing. SBS whose role is described in Annex 3 of the regulation. SBS offers SMEs an extra voice in the European standardization system by representing SMEs at the different stages of the development of European standards and other European standardization deliverables. SBS also signed partnership agreements with SEN and Senelec, and hence they have specific rights and obligations within the European standardization system, as written down in SEN Senelec Guide 25 the concept of partnership with European organizations and other stakeholders. I will come back on these rights <coughs> and obligations later, 
But first, I would like to invite Christelle to present SBS to us. Thank you very much, Ingrid, and good morning to everybody. Um, as Ingrid has just mentioned, um, SBS is the European Association representing SMEs in standardization. SMEs represent 99.8% uh, of all businesses in Europe, and you have all the relevant figures um, on the left of the slide um, that concern uh, SMEs in Europe. Um, you can see that they are, from an economic point of view, extremely important. But despite their economic uh, weight, SMEs, as Ingrid has mentioned, are underrepresented in the standardization process. And this was one of the reasons for the adoption of Regulation 1025 um, 2012, which Ingrid has just mentioned. The economic weight, the underrepresentation of SMEs, and the adoption of Regulation 1025 triggered the establishment of SBS in 2013. Uh, SBS is funded by the European Commission, EFTA member states, and membership fees. We currently have 21 members, which are national or European horizontal or sectorial associations. SBS mission is um, firstly, to represent the interest of SMEs in the standardization process at European level. Um, secondly, to raise their awareness for standardization. And thirdly, to motivate them to become involved in the standardization process. So how do we do this? Firstly, we represent and support SMEs in standardization, both on a technical and on a political level. On a technical level, we appoint experts to TCs and working groups. This year, we have 60 um, experts covering 20 sectors. They represent the interest of SMEs in the standards drafting process. Indeed, Christelle, as an extreme organization and Sen and Senelec partner organization, SBS has the right to participate as observer at Sen and Senelec governance level, so they can participate to the general assemblies and technical boards. And for what concerns SBS participation at technical level, so at the uh, TCs, subcommittees, and working groups, uh, Sen and Senelec BTs have decided that all European stakeholder organizations listed in Annex 3 of the European regulation and that have entered into partnership with Sen or Senelec, that these are entitled to participate in any technical committee and its relevant working groups, and this without any restriction. This means that SBS can have one representative participating in technical committee meetings as observer and can have experts participating in working groups. The representatives appointed by SBS will also receive all relevant documents of those technical committees and working groups they have requested access to. SBS also has the right to comment to all draft or final draft standards that are submitted to public, en public inquiry or vote. Okay, thank you, Ingrid. So that's for the technical aspect. Um, we are also involved on the political level. Uh, for example, SBS is a member of the governing bodies of the um, ESOs. We are an observer in the European Commission Committee on Standards, uh, and this is just to mention a few. Um, SBS also has its mission to raise awareness and motivate SMEs to engage in the standardization process. Um, this we do by engaging with stakeholders um, at international le uh, level. We are, however, primarily active at European and national level. We engage with the European institutions, the ESOs, the NSBs, and trade associations. At European and national level, we also organize several, several events and trainings every year. And I would like just to seize this opportunity to promote our annual conference, which is taking place on the 22nd of uh, May of this year, and to which you are all invited. Um, on the left side of this slide, you can see the list of sectors in which SBS experts participate directly in TCs and working groups. Um, on the right-hand side, you can see SBS sectorial approach. 
uh, these are the sectors that benefit from reinforced activities within SDS. And this is due to the particular needs of SMEs in these sectors. We currently cover four um, sectors, the construction, the ICT, the lift, and the PPE and textile care, PPE um, being personal protective equipment. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> okay. Um, we all agree um, that standards are necessary and that they are relevant to SMEs. However, they do not always take into account the specific features of SMEs, such as the fact that the average number of staff in a European SME is 45 people, or the frequency of testing, which is not always adapted. Therefore, SBS is of the opinion that the Think Small First principle, um, which applies when developing legislation, should also apply when drafting or revising standards. For those of you who are um, not familiar with the principle, it would mean, in the context of standards, that if a standard can be applied by a small company, it can be applied also by a large one. Now, of course, this does raise the question of how does one know if a standard is SME compatible or not? Well, SBS is seeking to answer this question by means of the SME compatibility test currently under development. So, what is the SME compatibility test? Let me start with some background information. In 2011, SenseNelec developed a SenseNelec guide on how to write standards taking into account SMEs' needs. This guide is known as Guide 17 and sets out a series of principles to facilitate the drafting of SME-compatible standards. The guide was also taken up um, by ISO and IEC. But Guide 17 only provides guidance for the drafting of standards. What we are seeking to develop is an assessment method by which the SME compatibility test, uh, by which the SME compatibility of a standard can be measured. The intention is to provide an overall assessment of the SME compatibility of any given standard. It is, and I stress, by no means intended to give a detailed evaluation of all the provisions in a given standard. Instead, it will provide a general assessment of the SME compatibility of the standard as a whole. Um, the test is composed of an assessment method, which is an Excel sheet, and of a user manual, which is in fact a guide on how to fill in the Excel sheet. The assessment method um, consists in scoring the standard based on a series of criteria by the means of questions, and I'll come back to this in just a while, in just a second, yes. Um, the criteria that have, be, that have been de developed are based on the SENSENELEC Guide 17. Um, the person carrying out the test must score each criterion and, when relevant, sub-criterion on a 1 to 5 rating scale. 1 is the, best, uh, is the worst, sorry, and 5 is the best. The assessment uh, method is implemented through an Excel spreadsheet, which automatically calculates the overall result. The higher the score, the more SME compatible the standard is. The test will also highlight the stronger and weaker aspects of a standard, which might be useful ahead of the revision of a standard. In reality, though, the test can be used at almost any point in time, but is perhaps most relevant before starting a revision of a standard or during the inquiry stage. Um, as I've mentioned, this test can be applied to all standards. Um, in SBS's view, the test should be carried out by people with experience of standardization and experience of the subject area covered by the standard. In fact, the person carrying out the test should ideally be in the same position as someone from an SME trying to apply the standard. <coughs> that is, with a good knowledge of the subject area, but not have been involved with the drafting of the standard and without too much experience of writing standards. So now let us have a look at the test more closely. 
As I've already mentioned, the criteria of the test um, to assess the SME compatibility of a standard is based on Guide 17. There is one question associated to each criteria, and occasionally there are sub-questions. The first question to answer is, are explanations given in the introduction of the standard adequate and appropriate? We know that the introduction is optional, unless a patent uh, right has been identified during the development of the document. However, when it is included, what we are looking at is if the explanations for the development or the revision of the standard are adequate and appropriate. Or put in other words, is the raison d'être of the standard um, explained properly? The introduction of a standard is very important. Many SMEs are unaware of which standard applies um, to their business. The, introdu the introduction should help them, therefore, identify if the standard is relevant to their business operations or not. This does not, however, require an explicit reference to SME. The second question is, is the scope of the standard clear and comprehensive? Um, this criterion is very important, and not only for SMEs. The scope of the standard needs to be clear. There can be no ambiguity. Um, it cannot be subject um, to interpretation, and it must be comprehensible to all. A standard whose scope is clear has more chances of being SME compatible than a standard that has an unclear scope. The next question is, does the standard contain an appropriate number of normative references? It is very common for a standard to refer to one or more standards. Um, however, what we need to ensure is that a standard does not refer to other standards unnecessarily. And the reason is that this obliges SMEs to buy the standards. Um, um, unnecessary normative references can be avoided by, for instance, copying or pasting um, the provisions for standard um, B into standard A if these are short. Having said that, though, we should not forget the general standardization provision, which is that large quantities of text should not be copied from one standard into another, so that the right balance must be struck. Um, the next uh, stand, um, criterion is, um, is the standard um, performance-based or prescriptive. This is a very difficult question. And the general rule is that whenever possible, requirements are expressed in terms of performance rather than design or descriptive characteristics. However, in practice, there may be cases where the inclusion of design requirements for some provisions uh, within a performance-based standard is appropriate. And there may even be cases where development of a completely design-based standard might be appropriate. The user manual provides further guidance for this criterion. Um, the next question is, does the standard include unnecessary text? Unnecessary text is not a decisive factor in whether a standard is SME compatible or not. However, it does make it more difficult to read. Examples of unnecessary text are historical explanations. Um, informative annexes can also be a source of unnecessary text. However, guidance on how to apply a test should be considered useful text. The next question, what are the levels of cost and difficulty associated with conformity assessment, is one of the most important criteria of the assessment method. The cost and difficulty associated with applying a standard are crucial factors in determining whether a standard is SME compatible or not. However, a word of caution um, is um, necessary here. Firstly, we need to make a distinction between, on the one hand, the legal obligation to place on all the users in order to comply with the provisions of a standard, and on the other hand, whether these provisions are reasonable and simple. Secondly, we need to make a distinction between a legal obligation to involve a third-party conformity assessment body and the obligation to place on manufacturers or suppliers by the standard itself. Therefore, under this criterion, we need to consider two aspects. One, whether there are requirements unnecessarily imposed, and two, when requirements are necessarily imposed, if the assessment method um, imposed is appropriate. Um, the um, SME compatibility test then looks at if there are technical mistakes in the standard. 
it's not rare for standards to contain mistakes. Some of the most common mistakes are a reference to a subclause or annex which does not exist, or conflicting provisions within the standard. A standard which contains mistakes or contradictions can lead to different interpretations. It can even, in some instances, result in not being able to satisfy all the provisions of a standard. And this makes it extremely difficult for SMEs, but also for larger companies. The next question, um, is the standard easy to read and understand, is quite a straightforward one. What this criterion looks at is if the standard uses the simple language and if it's easy to understand. Does it use jargon, which makes it difficult or impossible to read? Simple, straightforward language with no reference to unnecessary jargon makes it easier for SMEs to apply the standard and makes the standard more SME compatible. This is also valid for larger companies. Our examples given to, uh, are given to aid the application of the standard is the next question. We all know that standards can be complicated. To facilitate the application of a standard, guidance or advice on how to apply it can be useful for SMEs. This criterion looks at whether guidance is necessary. If guidance is necessary, the question is, is it available? And if it is, is it of poor, adequate or good quality. The next question is, will SMEs need to undergo modifications to apply the standard? In order to apply a standard, businesses often have to undertake changes. Just an example, they might need to change a production process or train staff. We're aware that this is a very difficult criterion. It requires an extensive knowledge of the implications of a standard but it is important for this criterion to be included in the SME compatibility test. However, we are aware that there will be cases when it will not be possible to respond to this criterion as the spectrum of SMEs impacted is too broad. Are the external elements needed to apply the standard available is the next question. It is important that the external elements which are needed to apply a standard are readily available. And the, under this criterion, we, look, we propose to look at um, aspects such as the availability of production um, equipment, the presence uh, relatively close of uh, laboratories uh, or of raw materials. And with this criterion, we want to avoid some past problems, such as proposing a test method, which is not available in all member states. Um, the next point and last point is the um, transitional period. Is it adequate? All standards have a transitional period, which is usually of six months after a standard is revised. For new standards, SMEs may need time to adjust, as it can be difficult and expensive for them to change their business model. However, we need to make cl clear that the desire to continue national provisions cannot be used to justify an extended period. So this is more or less the complete overview of the content of the SME compatibility. The next steps are the test um, will be finalized in the coming weeks. We will then start to share the test with the relevant st stakeholders and collect feedback on how it can be improved further. And the final test should be made available in September. So that's it for me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christelle. This brings us nearly to the end of this 1010 10 webinar. What we would like you to take away from this session is uh, send Senex Go to develop European standards and other technical specifications to respond to the needs of European industry, large and small, while meeting consumer, environmental and other societal expectations. Secondly, the national delegation principle is key for an effective participation of all stakeholders in the European standardization system. SBS has Annex 3 organization and having signed partnership agreements with SEN and Senelec have the right to participate at SEN and Senelec governance and technical level. When writing standards, think small first. SEN Senelec Guide 17 provides guidance for writing standards taking into account the needs of SMEs and SBS 
will value your feedback on their SBS uh, draft SME compatibility test. This closes the session on our participation with SBS. There is, however, an extra slide for which I would like to ask your attention. In view of the upcoming European elections on 23-26 May, Sen and Senelec published yesterday, so the 9th of April, their declaration Standards Build Trust to highlight the contribution standards make to achieve the priorities of European policymaking. SEN and Senelec's declaration highlights the important contribution of European standardization in supporting the objectives of policymakers. From artificial intelligence to sustainable energy up to smart appliances and blockchain, Europe will need to make many important decisions in the coming years to remain competitive in the world. SEN and Senelec have identified five strategic priorities on which standards can provide effective support to the European policymaking in the coming years. The first one is the harmonized single market. Secondly, a competitive European industry ready to lead in international trade. The third uh, strategic priority is building trust in new technology. Four is to enhance innovation for Europe. And five is the sustainable development goals of the UN 2030 agenda. You can read more about the SEN Senelec declaration on the SEN Senelec website or via www.standardsbuildtrust.eu.